Welcome to tonight's vital conversation, Young Leaders Reinventing Social Change. We are grateful to Bridgeway Capital Management for sponsoring our Fall Vital Conversations community series, including tonight's event. As a United Way agency, Interfaith Ministries for Greater Houston brings people of diverse faith traditions together for dialogue, collaboration, and service as a demonstration of our shared beliefs. Interfaith Ministries provides four main services, Meals on Wheels for Greater Houston and Galveston County, delivers more than 2 million meals each year for homebound seniors and people with disabilities across five counties. Refugee Services, in conjunction with the U.S. State Department, resettles hundreds of refugees in Houston. Interfaith Relations and Community Partnerships provides community services fostering understanding, respect, and engagement among Houstonians of all faiths. And Volunteer Houston connects volunteers in transformative projects with area nonprofits. Tonight's dialogue in, is the first in a three-part fall vital conversation series inspired by our original conversation with the three amigos. Archbishop Joseph A. Fiorenzo, Reverend William A. Lawson, and the late Rabbi Samuel Karf. For over half a century, these three Houston faith leaders have been joining their voices and influence in support of civil rights. Together, they found that when they stood together as a multi-faith trio, their presence and voice was more powerful than if any of them spoke out individually. The three friends joined forces in partnership with Interfaith Ministries for Greater Houston to present a virtual discussion on fighting for justice, equality, and respect as part of Interfaith Ministries Summer Series, the Dialogue Project, Vital Conversations with Our Community. In the June 19th opening conversation, the three amigos covered many topics, but one of the topics most important to them was how to cultivate the next generation of leaders. The three of them have said many times, that the pillars of light at Interfaith Ministries, Bridget and Bashar Kalai Plaza of Respect, are not meant to be mon monuments to their legacy, but rather inspirations for leaders here and now. Honoring their work, tonight's vital conversation will explore this important topic. Welcome. My name is Kim Mabry, Pro Program Manager for Interfaith Relations and Community Partnerships affectionately known as IRCP. And we welcome all of you to tonight's event. Before turning it over to tonight's panel, a little housekeeping. Please make sure that your chat box is up and available as resources will be placed in the chat box. And finally, a quick reminder, this evening's event is being recorded and also live streaming on Facebook. I will now turn it over to our, our, for the evening to our co-chairs for the Impulse Young Professionals Group and the moderators for tonight's discussion, Ms. Wendy Cooper and Ms. Alina Thalakanali. Sam DK joined Rice Management Company in 2020 as Manager of Strategic Initiatives. In this role, he is responsible for ensuring strategic investments, public policy, and external partnerships align with RMC's uh, core real estate strategy. Prior to joining RMC, Sam was Vice President of Programs for the Houston Land Bank, where he was responsible for managing programs to develop affordable housing, as well as overseeing partnership development and intergovernmental relations. Prior to joining the Houston Land Bank, he spent nine years on staff at Houston City Council with seven of those years as Chief of Staff for the Vice Mayor Pro Tem. Sam received a BS in Political Science from the University of Houston and is a Texas Legislative Intern Program alum. He was appointed by Houston City Council to serve on the Board of Directors, for Harris County Improvement District number 23 and is actively involved in community and economic development efforts around Houston, serving as a member of the Board of Directors of local nonprofits, uh, TXRX Labs Inc., East Ender Maker Hub, Architecture Center Houston Foundation, and Truly Home Inc. Victoria Hart is a native Houstonian. She is also a proud alum of Texas Southern University, where she received a Bachelor of Arts degree in English. Currently, she is pursuing a master's degree in public relations at the University of Houston. Her focus throughout her career has been to serve people. Previously, she has worked with local nonprofit Neighborhood Recovery Community Development Corporation as business relations director, overseeing their loan program, uh, Community Loan Center 
of Greater Houston, an initiative implemented to combat predatory lending in the community. She currently serves as community coordinator for HEB. As a new addition to the team, she works to bridge the gap between HEB and the local community, engaging in service-minded efforts throughout the year. Further showcasing her commitment to the Houston community, Victoria serves as vice president for the Houston Area Urban League Young Professionals and is a member of the Texas Southern Alumni Association, Houston chapter, um, Houston HBCU Alumni Association, and the Greater Houston Black Chamber, where she is part of their leadership program, Houston Black Leadership Institute. Trishna Narula is a Stanford medical student who took time off from her classes and rotations to work full time in the real world of public uh, health. As a native Houstonian and Rice alumna, she returned to her hometown in 2017, first as an intern in public policy with Senator Carol Alvarado, and then as the inaugural fellow in population health at Harris Health System, which serves a community of nearly 300,000 patients, 90 of which are uninsured or underinsured, and most of which are from minority groups. She has also been influential in the field of organized medicine and health advocacy, having served as elected speaker for over 50,000 medical students in the American Medical Association and appointed counselor on several of these physician committees as well as, well as authored resolutions that were influential in establishing new state laws. She has an ac uh, academic background in psychology and epidemiology and plans to re uh, pursue residency in psychiatry in the future, building a synergistic career in clinical medicine and the social determinants of physical and mental health. Um, and last but not least, Raj Sahodra is a native Houstonian and is executive director of Momentum Education. He attended Rice University and graduated in 2013 with majors in economics and policy studies. After Rice, he joined Teach for America and was placed at Yes Prep Southwest, where he taught pre-calculus and AP statistics. While at Yes Prep, he co-founded One Jump, an educational technology nonprofit that connects high school students to enrichment proper in opportunities. After Yes Prop, he attended Harvard Law School, where he focused on researching public policy issues and representing tenants with uh, being evicted from their homes. Also during law school, he started with st uh, students with Ambition Go Swag to College, a mentorship program, a mentorship nonprofit that provides underserved high school and college students mentors to help them get to and through college. After returning in 2018, Raj deferred a job with Baker Botts to run for Houston City Council at Large One. He secured a spot in the runoff, however, ultimately lost to an incumbent. Now Raj has, start, has launched Momentum Education, which combines One Jump and Swag to College to serve under-resourced high school and college students. Um, and we can get started with the first question. Can you each tell us a little bit more about yourself and what led to your current positions? Sam, can we start with you? Oh gosh, I thought the bio would have done that. <laughs> Um, I am, uh, I'm actually not a native Houstonian. I was born in Tyler, Texas, uh, but I got here as soon as I could. I've lived here for the majority of my life. Uh, I love this city. One of my passions is just having a good conversation with my, my neighbors. Uh, I love people. I love community organized efforts. And um, uh, I, I, I just love everything about Houston. I call this place a land of opportunity because I truly believe here in Houston more than anywhere else in the world uh, and anywhere else, surely in the United States, you can make something of yourself. And uh, people aren't looking to see what your last name is or uh, you know, your, your particular background, uh, but they're just wanting to know if you wanna work hard and be something. And uh, that's why I call this land of opportunity. And uh, I, I wanna make sure that I'm working to, to keep it that way. Thank you, Sam. Um, how about you, Victoria? Good evening, everyone. Uh, so once again, I'm Victoria Hart. I am a native Houstonian. So I was born and raised here in Houston, went to all schools in the Houston Independent School District, graduated from the high school for the performing and visual arts. Um, I grew up on the southeast side of of Houston, so um, the culture, uh, everything about that part of town uh, has made me who I am. Um, the opportunities um, that were in that area or the lack of made me want to go into the field that I am in as far as community, making sure that we have the resources, we have the opportunities that, that not many people are given. And so that's, that's what led me to my current position as, as community coordinator. I've been in this role uh, for about two years with HEB. 
I'm sorry, a year with HEB, but within the role uh, itself, the career uh, with, for five years. So I continue to do that because that's my passion, giving back to my community. Thank you, Victoria. Um, how about you, Raj? Yeah, no, thanks again um, for having this and, and for everybody for joining us. Um, yeah, I really echo a lot of what was, what was said. Um, you know, for me, I think, I think, you know, becoming a teacher, I think really kind of showed me the, both the vast inequity um, in the city, but also, you know, the incredible potential, uh, kind of what Sam mentioned. And so I think for me, it became, you know, how can we try to leverage um, people's innate strengths and, and communities sort of um, endowments to try to, you know, ensure folks can be successful. And then I think the sort of last piece of that came kind of during Hurricane Harvey, when I saw like everybody in the city really came together and I'll never forget, um, you know, going to uh, NRG and seeing like more volunteers than were actually needed there. And I think that spirit of kind of volunteerism and being involved in the community coupled with uh, the, you know, inequity that I mentioned earlier, but also the potential sort of all came together to try to launch momentum as a way to channel volunteers to, you know, provide supports for students to help them get to and through post-secondary education into the workforce. Thank you, Raj. Um, Trishna? Yeah, thank you so much, Alina, for the intro and to Kim, Wendy, and the whole team behind the scenes. Thanks for putting on this event. Thanks for having me be part of it. And thank you to everyone in the audience for joining the conversation tonight. Um, as Alina mentioned, my name is Trishna Narula. I was born and raised here in Houston, another native Houstonian. Um, my parents immigrated here from India in the late 70s, early 80s. Um, my mom actually growing up in Calcutta, India, worked with Mother Teresa. And so I think, you know, a big part of my upbringing was hearing their stories of how they came here for more opportunity for us and um, learning that, you know, I was lucky and blessed growing up to be a privileged person with those opportunities. I always wanted to learn to see how I could give back. And so um, stayed in town for college at Rice, um, studied psychology um, along with Raj here, who also is a Rice owl. Um, and then after college, I went to do more training in public health and then to medical school, as Alina mentioned. And then after finishing that and finally being done with school, instead of taking the more traditional path of going on to clinical residency, I just really wanted to dig deeper into public health and population health. And it felt like a way to make a difference on a larger scale for me. Um, so I came back home to Houston, um, dabbled in public policy for a while, and then found my way most recently to Harris Health System um, as a fellow in population health. And so that's a little bit about me and my journey so far. Um, again, happy and honored to be part of this panel and really looking forward to a good discussion tonight. Thank you, Trishna. Um, moving on, one thing everyone mentioned, either being a native Houstonian or going to school here um, from a young age. And so I just want to ask, how do each of you think um, that experience of growing up or going to school in Houston influenced your idea of community and community engagement? Um, so Raj, do you want to start, start us off? Sure. Yeah, you know, I'm, although uh, not born in Houston, um, born in California, moved here when I was one. And so I uh, vividly remember uh, the move. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. But um, spent obviously my whole life here, really. And I think for me, it has just become, um, and I think I saw this sort of even more um, on the campaign this past year. And, and, and I think all of you uh, will appreciate this. It's just like, this city is so diverse and has so many people from all walks of life um and yet and and although there is um real residential segregation based on income and uh certainly race and ethnicity and that's definitely something that has got to be addressed um at the same time i do feel that there is this unifying sense of being a houstonian which um, is it necessarily the case uh, all across the country? Certainly not the case in a lot of cities where folks are sort of in and out, which is, I think, much less the case here in Houston. Um, and so I think that seeing that sense of community, seeing that sense of folks willing to kind of help each other, you know, this is a city that has always kind of done the extraordinary from 
you know, being started basically on a swamp to, you know, going to the moon to everything else in between. And so I think it's that sense of possibility that um, has always excited me. And I think that kind of ability of folks to kind of come together to achieve a goal that seems tough, but, but is actually very doable. And I think that's what sort of drives me every single day. Thank you. Victoria, what about you? I think for me, uh, growing up where I grew up, I knew all of my neighbors. <laughs> um, and my neighbors knew me, uh, they knew our family. Um, we just had that, that collective community. And then even outward uh, with the civic associations, my parents were part of those. Um, so we just had a really great sense of community. Um, and then as I grew up, um, post-college, I think um, I became more um, more aware of how diverse, like Raj mentioned, like how diverse Houston actually is. Um, I think when I was working uh, for a bank, I didn't realize that um, certain areas just had certain niches of uh, cultures, um, which makes it so awesome to be a part of a city that has that many different ethnicities and cultures and uh, and races all together just in this huge melting pot. Um, I found out maybe a couple of years ago that Houston is the number one city for um, uh, cultural diversity, which is awesome. And I feel that everything that we do here in this city um, actually acknowledges that. Everything that we do, um, how we try to make everything uh, inclusive of every um, every person's background. Um, so that's what, that's what I feel most, most about how growing up here in Houston, and then of course, as an adult, what I see now in Houston. Thank you. Trishna, how about you? How do you feel like Houston's influenced you? Yeah, I think Raj and Victoria really hit the nail on the head. I think one of the most celebrated, um, loved, exciting things about Houston that's also one of my favorites is its diversity. Um, you know, growing up in Houston, you have friends from all sorts of backgrounds, cultures, religions, political affiliations, and that really leads to just a lot of learning um, and a richer life, I think. So diversity is definitely one of our strengths. Um, I will say that like in Houston, um, like most places in the world, along with the diversity, we do also have some disparities. That is one of our weaknesses. Um, and coming from the healthcare world, um, I think that's one of the places we do see inequalities in Houston. Um, you know, on the one hand, we have the Texas Medical Center, which is literally the world's largest medical center with 60 plus institutions. They see 10 million patient encounters every year. Just the TMC itself, their GDP is $25 billion. That's on one hand. Um, and then on the other hand, Houston and Harris County also have the largest number of uninsured um, in the entire United States. Um, almost one in every five people in Harris County is uninsured. And so I think when you have this city with the haves and have nots, um, that if you're one of the privileged ones, you kind of feel this sense naturally to try and give back to your community and make things better. And I think as Raj touched on, it's on us to change that. I think Houstonians own that. Um, we do feel that sense of responsibility and unity and we are working every day to improve that. Thank you. And Sam, even though you're not a native Houstonian, we still, we still claim you here. So how do you feel like it's influenced you? You're muted, Sam. Sorry, I, I was reborn in Houston. Uh, uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll claim that. Um, yeah, you know, I, I grew up in a uh, Nigerian household. And uh, so everyone was your aunt or your uncle. And uh, one thing that really helped me was watching my parents uh, as, as they interacted with people. They were very, very hardworking. They were, they, they were not the richest people, but they always found time to help other people in need. And that's something that stuck with me as a child all the way to my adulthood is that that's just what you do. And I see that so much in Houstonians here that are working hard every single day. Uh, you know, we're a family of three, I have two sisters. And, you know, there's so many families, uh, parents that are working hard every single day and they still find time to help their neighbor out or to help a family member out or help a stranger out. We saw that even yesterday as we had some localized flooding. Um, but I love that about Houston 
is that no matter who you are, people find ways to help each other out. And that's just something really special that has left a big imprint on me. And it's a challenge for me every single day because I want to, I want to live out uh, the, the best of what it means to be a Houstonian. Thank you. And now we'll, we'll move on to the next question. Uh, Alina, do you want to set us sure. up with that one? Sure. Uh, what do you see as the greatest obstacles to creating equity and justice in our community? And how can we as young professionals dismantle these obstacles? Um, it's an open floor, so whoever wants to start. Where do you start? Um, you know, I, I often say that in order to confront the world, you have to confront yourself um, first. Uh, and oftentimes, one of our greatest obstacles is, is recognizing that not everybody sees the world or has the same experiences as, as you. Uh, you may be fortunate, you may be less fortunate. Uh, you may have gone through certain experiences that have shaped you as who you are. But one of the challenges that I see is that oftentimes we we're, we're, we don't put ourselves in other people's shoes, uh, and it requires us to really think that not be satisfied. It's this this agitation in within yourself to not be satisfied until everyone has a place here in Houston. Everyone feels like they're welcome here in Houston. Everyone feels like they have an opportunity here in Houston. For me. As I think about it every single day, I always look at how can I be better as an individual, because I know me being better as an individual is allows me to offer the best to other people and to look at things in other uh, in other people's shoes and to so I, I, I often think about that self reflection is so important. Uh, and we often don't do that as individuals, we get kind of tunnel visioned into our own lives instead of stepping out of that and saying, you know what, there are folks that I, I, I haven't had the opportunity to engage with here in Houston or communities that I haven't had, just take some time, get away from the computer, get away from social media, drop your phone and just experience Houston, experience other people, take the opportunity to have a conversation with people. And that's just, uh, just my thought is, I, I think it's, we need to confront ourselves and ask ourselves, hey, you know what? Am I just sitting in my little tunnel, my, my little bubble here? Or is there an opportunity for me to engage people and, and find out what I can do to be a better Houstonian, what I can do to contribute to helping someone realize their full potential? Maybe I can just add kind of like one, one thing that, that comes to mind. Um, and I've kind of seen this kind of recently with momentum is I think Sam touched on it is like, I think a lot of folks um, before they're going to take action are going to um, need to see the data. And I think a lot of people don't understand the level of disparity that we have um, here in the city of Houston. So, you know, when I am talking to folks, particularly about education, obviously now, you know, when we share the fact that only 15% of low income young folks are completing education beyond high school, but two thirds of jobs require such education. I think when folks understand that, wow, this is a huge disparity, there, there, there's a greater spur to action. I think it's not because folks are not good people or whatever. I think it's just that they don't understand some of the challenges. And obviously part of that is incumbent upon folks to get out and, and you know, try to understand the situation of others, of course. I think part of it is, you know, for those of us who have sort of taken this cause, whether full time as a profession or as like a hobby or because we just like believe it's the right thing to do. I think part of what we can do is just helping to sort of illuminate the reality uh, for those who may not currently know it, uh, whether through data or stories or experiences. And just to piggyback off of that, um, I think that I totally agree with everything that's been said so far. And I really like that Sam started with, um, you know, the biggest obstacle sometimes we have is ourselves. And I think that's totally true. Our own thinking, you know, thinking that 
how can one person really change the world or what can we do? We're kind of helpless and um, how will anything we do change the status quo? I, I don't think that's true. I think all of us are powerful. All of us can make a difference. Um, I saw a question in the panel just come up that we might get to in more detail later, um, but about voting. I think it's really timely to talk about this. Um, yesterday was National Voter Registration Day. Um, obviously the presidential election is coming up. The deadline to register in Texas is you know, less than a couple weeks away. Um, and a lot more people have registered already this year than before. Um, but we know that you know, tonight is about young leaders affecting change and historically young people um, are very passionate about a lot of issues. But as you know, someone just asked in the chat, they often don't come out to vote. Um, the last presidential election, only half of the electorate um, eligible to vote between 18 to 24 years came to vote. And it's much, much less in local elections, um, which still matter a lot. Um, so I think that's one very tangible thing that we can all do um, to make a difference. Um, if you ever feel that, hey, the government doesn't really care about my interests or my generation's interests, they're kind of out of touch with us, the way to change that, the best way and the easiest way um, is to vote. Um, and Michelle Obama said recently, you know, in the, in the last presidential election, the winning margin averaged out to just two votes per precinct, um, two votes. So it really is true that every vote matters. Um, I won't tell you who to vote for, but please, please, if you can vote. Um, this year, I know there's some concerns about COVID and safety, but at least in Harris County, there's a bunch of drive-through locations that you can use, um, you know, wear a mask, be safe. But if you can, please exercise your right to vote. It's free and it really does make a difference. Um, if I can kind of, I guess, piggyback off of everyone, uh, what Trishna said is, is just so true. Um, I feel like getting over some of these obstacles when it comes to, um, dismantling uh, inequities in our community is voting. Um, we have to not only preach it, we have to actually do it. And so I think um, when, um, when I've, been, I've been working with the Houston Area Urban League Young Professionals for the past two years, and every year we, pu we push, we push not even, not so much for just the, not just for the presidential election, but also for the local elections, because we know that when we vote, we're voting for the mayors, we're voting for the city council, and these are the people that actually represent those neighborhoods, uh, represent um, those areas, and if those people's views don't align with what you feel or what you feel the change needs to be, then vote for someone who will. It's really that simple. And I feel that a lot of people don't exercise, don't take that opportunity to actually get out and vote and, and elect the people that are going to stand for your, for your platform, the things that you want to see change. I think that now more than ever, um, especially um, since the, the passing of Ruth, uh, uh, our Supreme Court Justice, uh, I just, it's, to me, it's more now so than ever to, to, to actually exercise your right to vote. Wendy, can I add an additional item? I, I think it's important since we kind of transition to voting. Um, democracy is a continuum. Uh, it's an effort that it is a continuum. Voting is a very important part of the process, and it is one of those abilities for us to participate in our democracy. Sometimes we talk about government as if it's this distant third, you know, you know, foreign entity that we, you know, we, we have no connection to. But in the United States, the government is the people, even if we at times don't feel like they represent the people. Uh, what we're afforded here in the United States is the opportunity to shape our form of government. But it doesn't just end at the ballot box. It is a continuum, it's a process that requires constant engagement and vigilance uh, and participation. It is getting out there, you know, it's doing the things that Raj was doing, you know, when he was running for office, you know, knocking on doors, talking to your neighbors. And when I say talking to your neighbors, it is having real conversations with people. Oftentimes we talk past each other. And when you stop to just listen and listen beyond the words that people are saying, you find oftentimes that you're saying the exact same thing. And so 
what I will encourage all of us to do is that I know that it can be extremely frustrating when you go vote and it doesn't turn out the way you want to, or you see a process that just looks beyond hope. But I would encourage you that change doesn't happen overnight. That change, we talk about change like, you know, it's like we snap our finger and it, it's supposed to change. We have to be able to have this deliberate patience about ourselves. And what I mean by that is impatient with being patient. Uh, be patiently impatient, I should say. Uh, and, and for me, that means I'm impatient. I want to see things happen. And so I'm going to keep pushing and I'm going to keep working. I'm going to keep organizing. I'm going to keep work, talking and having the, the hard discussions that move us forward. But I'm going to be understanding in the sense that it will take time to see all that I want to. And it may be not in my lifetime, I won't be able to see all of it, but I need to be able to pass the torch to the next generation. Thank you, Sam. Um, I love this conversation about just really engaging with one another, one another and like having those conversations, whether they're difficult, whether you agree, whether you disagree. So I, I wanna try to turn it a little um, because yes, we want to have all of these face-to-face -face conversations, but also our generation has the ability and the knowledge to use technology to help these things too, to advance this mission in ways that prior generations just weren't able to do because they didn't have access to the same technology. So, I just want to open it up to everyone. How do you think we can best utilize the connective power of the internet, of social media, and other technological innovations to bring about social change? I, um, me personally, I feel that conversations like this, it opens that opportunity. Um, um, we are in a time now where we have to rely on technology for a lot of things as far as connectivity with uh with our within our network i know that when we host events with the houston area urban league young professionals we have to kind of just be mindful of where we are with covid uh, but we still want to be able to put on a uh, programming that benefits everyone that that we touch um i know that with everything that's going on, I'm, I'm happy that we're still able to kind of have this type of dialogue. Um, at the end of the day, I think I'm, I'm, I personally want to know more about other people of different ethnicities and races and how they feel about, um, about what's going on now and then be able to connect in a way so that we can kind of make some positive change that way. Where I'm, it's, it's all about honoring the diversity, but then also having the, the inclusion there. Totally agree with Victoria. Um, I think, of course, Wendy, you alluded to this um, in the introduction at the beginning. Um, social media and technology is definitely here to stay. Um, it is a double-edged sword. I think we are all very thankful it exists during the pandemic, it's helping us stay connected and keep in communication, keep working for a lot of people, um, talk to loved ones across the world that we can't reach by travel otherwise um, during COVID. Um, definitely to be able to find any information at our fingertips 24 seven online. Um, I think I've used social media more than usual this year um, from a public health perspective, just trying to spread awareness and information about COVID. And I've seen a lot of other physicians and epidemiologists kind of doing the same thing. And I think that's been helpful, um, at least for me. Um, at the same time, you know, on the other side of the coin, there has been a lot of misinformation um, from a health perspective going viral, really pun intended online. Um, that is, you know, hard to control, damaging, um, and sad in many ways um, when people believe things to be true that are not that could affect their health. Um, there are studies showing that, you know, almost 30% of YouTube videos that are watched around the world um, about COVID are false or contain false information. Um, and that's reached, you know, 60, 70 million people in the world. And that study was from March. So you can only imagine now in September um, how prevalent that is. So I really think that at the end of the day, Victoria said like, the phrase being mindful 
I think that's key. Um, nowadays, you know, everybody, whether they realize it or not, is really a micro influencer. Um, we're used to having one on one conversations with people or, um, you know, dinner party conversations. And now things that we post online can be viewed by hundreds of thousands of people across the world. So I think just being mindful when we're publishing and sharing things on social media, knowing that it's going everywhere and then also being mindful when we're viewing and consuming um, social media realizing that for the most part nobody's fact checking things um, and even more importantly you're usually seeing only part of the picture you're seeing the pretty part the perfect part the filtered part not the full reality um, and that impacts you know not only physical health potentially with covid um, but also your mental health um, and thinking hey my life sucks everybody else is out there having a great time and that's just not true. Um, you know, again, it's a double-edged sword. There's, speaking of mental health, great benefits that some people feel comfortable sharing their stories and struggles um, with strangers that they wouldn't be able to otherwise. And people realize they're not alone, um, that there's, you know, more people in the same boat. So again, there's good and bad. And I think we just have to continue to be mindful um, when sharing and when consuming social media and try and maximize the good and minimize the bad. You know, I, I always like to ask the question, um, you know, we're involved in an innovation district here in, in town. It's like, what is technology? You know, at one point, you know, a candle was technology. It, 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 it's something that is, is constantly evolving. I, I think the real question for all of us in, in the self-reflection mode should be with all of these things that we try to harness, it should be through the lens of, of we of how does it impact others? How can we do things better? How can we lift up the least of us, the least among us, and so that we're together moving our society forward? If you think about, for example, harnessing fire, you know, it serves one person, great, but it serves a lot more people when you can warm a community, right? Or water that is able to not just service one person, but can go through pipes and, and, and provide water for an entire community. I think as we look to technology, the things that we call technology, we have to be of that same mindset of how can we make this a collective good? It is when we think selfishly about things, about only the way that it can benefit us or, or, or meet our immediate need that we tend to abuse the things that can be used as tools to actually progress us forward as a society. And I, I think when you look at social media, uh, you know, we see the, the, the opportunities with a, as a collective effort, as it's been used in places to get messages to people that, you know, weren't able to connect with people. Families who are able to connect across the ocean who normally wouldn't be able to see each other's faces. But there's a, there's, a, there's a dark side of that, and it tends to be when we focus only for our own benefit. And, and that's why I say, I think, through any lens that we're, excuse me, through any technological tool that we're using, the lens should be, how do we do things better? And how can we bring up our neighbors around us? Yeah, um, I basically agree with all that. Um, I'll add uh, two, two quick things that like are very concrete examples that I think about a lot. Um, so on the voting front, we now have apps that will, um, mobile apps, that will look at your contacts, compare it to the voter registration file, and tell you which of your friends are A, not registered, and B, are registered but haven't voted. So you can literally just text your friends only to make sure they go vote. And so many people on this call do not like to phone bank, do not like to canvas, particularly during COVID, but everybody should be taking the time to talk to a few friends. And it is so easy to do now in a way that it was not pre these apps. I'm happy to refer folks to apps later on. The second thing is like, at a minimum, you know, technology has made it so easy to, uh, you know, I think about this in the education context, uh, support students who you may not necessarily see on a day-to-day -day basis. So by way of example, Everybody in this call could give a career presentation to high school students who have not yet heard of what their, that career might be, because maybe nobody in their community has gone uh, you know, into that career, for example. 
or everybody on this call could review a college uh, application essay, for example, because the high school has 300 kids per college counselor and the college counselor does not have the wherewithal to review every single essay as is common in very uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, higher income high schools. So those are just things that technology has made super easy. And so I think what I think about is it is now much easier to volunteer and to get involved and to enact social change because uh, the sort of barrier to entry, so to speak, is dramatically reduced from where it was before. Wendy, I just want to add one quick thing I thought about that um, I've noticed a lot this year, especially is um, I feel like a lot of people, um, especially in 2020, feel like we live in a divisive world at times nowadays. Um, and it seems a lot easier for people to type things out on a screen to a stranger that they would probably never say to that person face to face um, because it's not as kind as they would be face to face. And that's not just our generation or young people. Anyone on social media, I think, myself included, um, should always be mindful that, you know, the golden rule applies in the World Wide Web too, in the virtual world be kind, talk to others with the respect that you'd like to be given. Remember, there's a living human being reading whatever you're writing on the other side of the screen. Um, you know, if you're having a conversation you're really passionate about, if you're trying to advocate for change or fight for something you believe in, that's fine. Um, just be nice and polite and patient. Um, try to put yourself in their shoes, see where they're coming from, find common ground. Um, you probably have more similarities than you do differences. And you know, that's not only the right thing to do, um, if you're really trying to change your minds about something, it's probably gonna be more effective that way too. So that's something I constantly remind myself and I think you know, all of us could do a better job of. Thank you everyone, that was great to hear. Um, and then on the other hand, as young professionals, sometimes it's overwhelming to know that a lot of the systems and policies and companies and organizations that were created before we were even born have so much power and it can feel like history is something we must work against rather than build upon. Do you have any words of wisdom on how we can change certain elements in society for good? Be impatiently patient. Um, I, I go back to that. It's like, it's frustrating. I, you know, I worked in government for, for nine years and, um, you know, I, as a, as a millennial, you know, you know, we come from a microwave generation. Uh, there are things that we just, we don't want to wait around for. Like, it's like, we know what to do. Let's, let's just get it done, you know? And what I realized is that nothing great happens overnight. It just doesn't. Uh, it requires consistent and diligent work to get something done. And that's just something that we have to realize within ourselves to prepare ourselves for things that, that, that could be a fight. There, you know, as you mentioned, there are a lot of systems that have been in place for long before we were here uh, and, and on this earth. I like to always say just because something exists doesn't mean that it's the best way to do things. Uh, we have the opportunity to shape our future, but we don't get to shape it if we get frustrated and decide not to participate in, in, in doing that. And so I love just being impatiently patient uh, and, and keep pressing forward uh, and, and come up with ideas. I mean, we're blessed with the the, the ability to, you know, you were young and so we don't tend to be as jaded, you know, even if one day we're jaded, the next day we're like, okay, I got another idea, you know, and, and we're ready to go again. So let's use that to our advantage and keep, keep pressing forward. Um, I just, you know, it, it is frustrating. I, I, d I definitely want to acknowledge that it is frustrating to see things the way that they are because we know that they can be better. Uh, but they don't get better by us just complaining about it, right? It's like, oh man, the house is dirty. Uh, what should I do? Well, I get, I get up and I do something. It may not be cleaned in that minute, but if I keep at it, it's going to get cleaned. And we have an opportunity 
no matter what the obstacles are, no matter what anybody says, we have the opportunity to shape the future that we want to see. I totally agree with, uh, with Sam. Thank you so much for saying that. Um, I have to admit, today was one of those days where um, a lot of people within my network, uh, a lot of friends were having those feelings of, um, of being disenfranchised um, because of what happened today uh, in Kentucky. And I, and I don't wanna kinda <laughs> like sugarcoat that. It's just, it's, it's really hard to, to see that on the news and to see a situation like that and then people are not being held accountable. Um, but once again, um, just like Sam said, that we have to kind of uh, impatiently, impatiently wait, is that what you said? In a patiently way, like I think we're at a at a moment now where we are demanding change, and we're we're speaking it so loudly um, that we have to make our voices known, um, whether it be posting something on your um, on your on your Facebook just to let people know your you know, your your feelings about it, and then that could just that can create a dialogue that helps people to understand maybe where you're coming from, someone that's not from the same the same culture to understand why you're feeling the way that you're feeling. I've actually had a lot of my friends who I grew up with um, in high school and uh, middle school who've asked me personally, like, hey, Victoria, how can I help? How can I, how can I show my support? And to me, that means the world to me because that means that you want to listen. That means that you want to hear, um, you want to see change. You want to you be able to help and be able to push that, that narrative out as well. And so I think that now um, it's, it's really just more so about like getting with your network and, 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 and having those, co those harsh conversations now so that people can kind of rally together and be able to, to, to get on board with what we're trying to do. And we're trying to make these changes uh, known and, and make them evident in our police and with police reform, uh, social justice, and, and all of that. I just, like I said, I just want people to understand that your voice is what matters. Thanks, Sam and Victoria. Um, Sam, something you said made me think about um, one of the quotes by RBG. Victoria, you were talking about RBG earlier. Um, so she said that real change, enduring change, happens one step at a time. Just like you're saying, Sam, it doesn't happen overnight. So we have to be impatiently patient. Um, and I remember my first week working at Harris Health System, it was my first real job. I had a 10 minute meeting with our CEO, Mr. Massey at the time. And um, there was like one minute for questions at the end. Um, and I asked him, what do you think is the biggest strength and biggest weakness of this large system serving the underserved um, population of Houston? And he said, our biggest strength is our, you know, almost 10,000 employees that come to work every day, wanting to make a difference, putting their best in that day. Um, and our biggest weakness is because we're such a large system, um, he compared it to you, a Navy ship, massive Navy ship. Um, he's a military man. If you're trying to change course for that ship, sometimes even, you know, a few degrees east or west takes a day or two to move the ship. And so, you know, such a large system, such a large city of Houston or country of America or the world, changing things that have been, you know, ground in history does take long, um, but that doesn't mean we don't chip away a little bit at a time. And each step, each thing we do, um, as small as we think it is, builds up and makes an impact eventually. And so, you know, your question was, what do we do when history feels sort of heavy? Um, I think think to the past and see how far we have come. Um, you know, this year was the 100th anniversary of women's suffrage. Can you imagine 100 years ago, women were not given the right to vote or we didn't have, you know, cars or planes or phones or computers, um, most, you know, medical therapies um, and how much we've progressed in terms of the civil rights movement. And then looking to the future, something that gives me hope and optimism that someone once told me growing up and it's sort of one of those things that stuck is that, you know, 100 or 120 years from now, everybody walking this earth will be totally new from today. 
it won't be us or those of us around today. It'll be, you know, our kids, our grandkids, our great grandkids, fresh, you know, new set of people, complete turnover. Um, you know, maybe one guy left from the Guinness Book of World Records who was 130 and still alive. But for the most part, you know, they'll know what we leave for them. They'll know what we teach them, what we choose to pass on. It doesn't necessarily have to be what we grew up with. It can be um, if that's what we want to pass on to the future, but it can also be what we think is best for them, what we think would be ideal. And, you know, then they'll have their own ideas and create their own ideal that we probably could never imagine today. Um, but I think that's an opportunity for a total reset and that gives me a lot of optimism and hope and promise. Yeah, so I'll keep it super brief. I think about two things. Um, one is uh, the number 800,000. That is the number of Texans who have registered to vote since 2018. Um, the last Senate race in Texas was decided by 200,000 votes. So the point I'm trying to make is, uh, it's incredible that so many folks are showing up to get registered to vote because they want to be part of the process. So that's the first thing. Uh, the second thing is, um, Julian Castro, former mayor of San Antonio, uh, said the American dream is not a sprint or a marathon, but a relay. And I think he's so right about that, that it's our job to move the ball down the field as much as we can and then pass the baton to the folks coming behind us to keep moving it down the field um, just a little bit more. And so what gives me hope is, you know, every day um, I'm lucky enough to work with high school and college kids who are ready to take the baton. Like they are ready to um, do their part. And I think um, if we and all of us sort of are ready to sort of coach and support and then ultimately pass the baton, um, things are just gonna get better and better. Thank you, Raj. Um, all of these have just been truly inspirational answers. Um, before we open it up for Q&A, um, we have a lot of young professionals on the call here tonight. And so just building on this inspiration, um, Victoria mentioned, you know, the conversations about justice um, and that these are conversations we want to have. Um, but I, I want to ask each of you um, if there are young professionals who feel like they haven't necessarily reached a level of power yet um, or influence, do you have any words of advice um, for how they can have these conversations of justice within their community and within their workplaces? I'm happy to start, Wendy. Um, that's a great question. I think one of our um, participants, Jay Harburg, also had a, you know a similar question, like how, how do you get people more involved and how do you spread this enthusiasm and what can you really do? Um, and I think something that we, we've talked about a little bit already tonight is you can just start really small. Um, and one of the one of the quotes I really like by Mother Teresa, um, again, is if you want to change the world, go home and love your family first. And I think we can extrapolate that to say, um, you know, if you want to change things in the world, change things at home first, change things at your workplace, change things at your place of worship, or even in your social media circle, or like Sam said, you know, even with yourself, look in the mirror, um, take a look at your own behavior, your own actions, your own beliefs, see how you can constantly improve, um, you know, be the change you wish to see. Another cliche, but it, it really is true. Um, and like John Lewis said, you know, if you see something that's not right, if it's something not fair, not just, you have an obligation to say something and do something. And, you know, a lot of th times I think um, people think that doing something or saying something means getting elected to political office or founding your own startup. And that might be true for you, but that's not something you have to do to make a difference. Um, it can be something small, but still very impactful. And I want to give a quick concrete example um, because, you know, it's easy to say and hard to imagine what that could be. Um, I remember there was a story I read online um, sometime in June this year. It was the, in the wake of George Floyd's death a couple weeks after all the Black Lives Matter protests. And it was a very everyday situation. Um, 
who was a white Caucasian woman who went to a Starbucks in a Target store. Um, she got her coffee, she was ready to go. Starbucks in one hand, large purse in her other shoulder, and she was exiting the Target. Um, and another customer um, was also leaving at the same time. He was an African-American gentleman. Um, and they're both heading out, the alarm goes off, the detector on the way out, super loud, reflexively, they turn back to see what's going on. Um, and of course, everyone else in the store turns to look at them. And the lady, the Caucasian lady who was writing the story said, it seemed to her all eyes went directly to the black man. And the target employee rushed over to them to you know, figure out what's going on, immediately looked to the white lady and said, you're good to go. And then turned to the black gentleman and asked him for his receipt. He obliged, everything was fine. And he said, you're okay to go as well. But the white lady stopped and she asked the employee, why don't you wanna check my purse? And he said, I don't need to. And she said, why? And just that one word and he didn't have an answer for her and they all kind of knew what she was getting at um but it didn't need to be said and so on their way out you know the lady in the manor exiting target finally and the black gentleman says thank you to the white lady and he asked her you know if this had happened a month ago before george floyd's death before all the black lives matter discussion and protests in this country would you have said something and she said, no, I actually probably wouldn't have been no even noticed. And he said, this is what this movement is about. These are the things that matter. Everyday small things that a lot of people don't even notice. These are the things that are important. And that's what really disrupt means. Disrupt means, you know, saying even one word that can make all the difference that, you know, the story was left with, you know, three people probably thinking about it still today and people like me who have read the story and are also still thinking about it. Um, and it's not necessary that the employee in the story is the bad guy. He may not even have thought about what he was doing or realized he was being, you know, racist, but he's been conditioned like all of us in society. And so I think small ways like that, one word that this lady said um, is such a good way to keep ourselves in check and keep those around us in check and really make an impact over time. Oh, um, that, that, was, uh, that was very powerful, uh, Tristan. Uh, I just kept thinking as you were telling that story about empathy. And, you know, in the spirit that goes with empathy and is, is very powerful. And oftentimes we don't exercise that enough in our lives uh, and, and we don't give that to other people. And it's, when we, when we talk about motivating other people to be part of something, you know, it, it's, it's hard for folks to, when they feel frustrated, or they're hearing frustration from, from us, to feel motivated to be part of something. But it can be as simple as just doing good. You know, just doing good. That, what that lady did, she didn't have to do. She could have walked out, minded her own business, stayed in her bubble, and, and moved on. But the fact is, when we choose to confront ourselves and our potential biases, our potential, uh, our potential uh, 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 privilege that we may have, it allows us to see the world through other people's lenses, to see the world through their experiences. And then to think, man, what can I do in the way that I interact with people to demonstrate to this person that their life has value, just like mine. And that is powerful. When people are talking to you and they feel that you, have val that you value them as much as you value yourself, we've been given this great platform, social media and and, you know, and, and wherever else in our different leadership roles. And there's a tendency as human beings to project. Project, we want to project, but we don't want to listen. We don't want to learn. We don't want to see. 
we're only guided by the things that we have in our mind and our self-interest. But when we sacrifice those selfish interests for others, we allow the opportunity to, to change the world and we allow the opportunity to change the way we see the world. Uh, but in order, like I said before, in order to change the world, you have to change the way you see the world. And I ultimately believe that helps to motivate others when you communicate that spirit of giving and a willingness to learn and listen. I want to um, kind of touch on what Trishna said. I think for me, um, I've just been encouraging a lot of my friends um, who don't feel that they have um, that political voice or, or they're not so uh, knowledgeable about what's going on um, just to just kind of reach within their close network. I know for myself, um, recently when we've been uh, talking about how much um, how much our city is impacted by the census. Um, when people are not counted, how much money that we lose uh, within education, uh, schools, uh, roads, um, uh, different programs, um, state representatives, things like that, that just need to be able to, to speak to that. I've been making sure that I had a, a group text where I literally text everyone in my family just to ask them if they had completed the census. And that little one thing right there is just to make sure that we are being counted. I think that's something that's important. So that's something that's very small that you can do, um, but it makes such a huge impact in the greater scope of things. Um, right now, I am choosing to also just focus on um, my platform as a leader. I, I, I won't sit here and say that I have the biggest network, but I wanna make sure that uh, the things that I'm, um, um, posting or talking about I'm knowledgeable about and I have um, some um, I've actually read up on it and to be able to speak to it uh, so that someone asks me a question I can answer to it um, that's the time that that we're living in like I said even with the smallest network that you have you just still have an opportunity to have a voice and to be able to speak to those around you Yeah, I, I would just add, um, Cory Booker was asked why, why he was running for president. Um, the the uh, questioner said, um, you have a lot of similar ideas to a lot of other folks who are running. And he said, I'm running because I think there are a lot of incredible people on the sidelines who want to get involved, but aren't yet figured out how to get involved. And I'm running to get people off their couch and involved in the process. And I think all of us on this call are clearly involved in the process in whatever way that looks like in your life. And so what I just think about all the time is, like Victoria said, like we all have a network, big, small, whatever. And I think it's all incumbent upon us to say, let's make sure that everybody in our network is involved in the process, whether that for them is filling out the census, whether that for them is registering to vote, whether it's going to vote, whether it's contributing money, whether it's contributing time, you know, whatever it, it might be um, until we get everybody in our network on sort of involved. I think it's going to be very hard to truly have the change that, that I think we all want to see. Thank you, everyone. Um, thank you, Raj, Victoria, Trish, and Sam for all these thoughtful responses to all the questions we've asked. Um, and I'm going to open up the floor to um, Q and A portion of our event. For many generations, people were told, don't talk about religion or politics in public. How has this rule of etiquette been a detriment to society? Uh, does your generation think differently about speaking to religion and politics in public? Yeah, you know, uh, politics is, <laughs> I, you know, I tell people all the time, I, you know, again, I've worked in politics for nine years. Uh, I'm just, some days I, I, I'm still in politics. I, I tell people all the time, I worked in government. Politics is in everything that you do, okay? You go to, my politics just happens to do with government, right? Your, your politics may be in finance or whatever. If you go to work, you're going to have politics, okay? So it, it doesn't do us any justice or it doesn't move forward any conversations to not talk about something. It's like, oh, I have a problem. I'm not going to talk about it. When has it ever worked in any point in our lives? Uh, I, I, I think it's always helpful to have a conversation. 
with the understanding that you may walk away and not agree. And that's okay. It's okay. But I'm willing to bet that a majority of the time when you're conversating and you're actually truly having a conversation, you're going to walk away from that conversation agreeing about something. Well, the first thing is you agreed to have a conversation. So that's your first step, right? And, and I think we have to get to a point as, as individuals where we're okay with, without, with having a conversation, without setting preconditions that the only time we're going to have a conversation is if we agree to 100% of the outcome. You know, it's like, well, that doesn't make any sense. I mean, what, what, we don't apply that standard to anywhere else in our lives. I always use the example of traveling. I say, you may travel with a group and not agree to everything that you're going to do when you get there, but that doesn't stop you from getting on the plane. I mean, so why are we having these standards that we don't apply to anywhere in our life or even our own families? Well, I'm not going to talk to you because I don't agree with you. Today. That's, you know, I, I think in terms of the online conversation, just like any tool, whether it was on the phone, online, we have to be careful that we are, we are giving people the opportunity to have their position. It may be something that we totally disagree with, but in terms of progress and how we move forward, unless someone feels like they've had an opportunity, I've always uh, worked off of this philosophy, people are more willing to listen to you if they feel like you've listened to them. And so I give people the opportunity to express where they, even if I totally disagree and I'm like, where, where is that from? Where, like, where did you get that from? I still give them the opportunity to express themselves because then I have the ability to exchange and share my worldview and my thoughts. And then we either come to some consensus or we don't, but we had a conversation and we're at least dealing with each other on a level that is civil. And that's what we need to return to society is a point where we can have a civil conversation, even if we disagree. Any other thoughts? Um, sure, I'll chime in. <laughs> this is Carmela Walker. Um, um, what are some outliers of ideas that you may have aside from kind of like the same Trojan horse pathway that we've taken for years, you know, um, to, to change and to move the needle and to create probably mm -hmm. more action around um, what needs to happen. Um, voting is great. Um, you know, census is great. But I think that there's something uh, a little bit more impactful that needs to happen, p particularly from, a, from, from the lobbyist uh, position. Um, and I saw a lot of that in Austin and um, the influence and the impact that it has in terms of um, um, getting um, folks on committees to, um, to, make, to, to, to vote on certain items. So what's your, what are your thoughts on that? in terms of coming up with maybe unique ideas to broach that subject and, and approach it from a different perspective? Well, thank you. I'll, I'll, I'll give a quick answer to that. I, you know, I, I tend to approach things from the, the common person, the everyday person. And the reason why is because I, I, you know, when I think about moving the needle, I think about the, the people that are, you know, they, they have their head down every single day and they're working. They're not watching the news and they're not politicos like myself. You know, they may not even know who represents them. But I always say one of the things that you can do that doesn't require you turning on that news is volunteer. Help do something in your neighborhood. You know somebody that is in need somewhere. There are things that we can do every single day that can help move the needle in our space. And if everyone is working to do that, uh, right, somebody put volunteer Houston. They're, they're, if everyone is working to do that, man, you would see the, the world a better place. You know, I always say a relationship is, 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 is essentially an exchange. It's you give, I give, you give, I give. Where it breaks down and where we see it breaking down in society 
is where it's you give and well, I, I get, right? The, the, the exchange is broken. And that's where we need to go back to this, you give, I give. If everyone is in the mindset of doing something, doing just something little, man, you could see some changes. And yes, there'll be people that step up and do even more things. They'll get organized. They'll lead rallies. They'll, they'll lead protests. You know, I'd say people protest in different ways. You may not recognize it as a protest, but people in the, in the way that they live their lives, it can be a protest. It can be an advocacy. Uh, and, and so as long as we are doing something every single day, and it's not just focus on ourselves, but focus on how we can bring, again, the least and the last of us up, I think that's moving our society forward. Thank you, Sam. Um, I appreciate that answer. And Carmela, I really appreciate that question. Um, we have one last question to get to really quick. Um, I want to throw this out there and see if anyone's brave enough to jump on it. Um, the question is, do you ever feel conflicted about encouraging people to vote who you're pretty sure want to vote for the outcome that you're not for? So basically someone of another political party. Um, why or why not? And how do you handle this? Yeah, so, so, so I saw that question. I tried to put some kind of answer. It's not clear to me what the right answer is here. But, but my gut feeling tells me that we want people in the process, like period. Like we, we want people who, who, who care about the process because I think folks who vote, probably also are gonna get involved in their community, might get involved in their faith organization, might follow Martin's advice and go to volunteer Houston uh, and volunteer in an organization. Um, and so I think we definitely wanna get folks involved, but I go back to Sam's point about just engaging with folks at a relational level. I think part of it is step one is asking folks to vote, but steps two is to have a conversation on some of the issues and why a certain candidate or a certain party or a certain platform has an impact uh, one way or the other. You know, I think about um, a recent, semi-recent law called SB4 that passed here in the state of Texas that basically said, if you're uh, pulled over, you can be asked to prove uh, that you're here with documentation. And I think a lot of folks, when they hear that, think, yeah, that like might make sense. Like, you know, we all should be you know, required to do that. But then when, when I would go around and talk to folks, sort of give the example of, you know, a student I taught or a student that, you know, um, others have taught who, who, you know, was undocumented and gets pulled over for like a broken taillight or for an expired registration, like that's something that all of us, you know, may have done at some point. And then you explain to folks that, hey, the consequences of that is this individual might actually get deported because of this. And I think when you take the time to have that conversation, folks begin to realize like, wait a minute, maybe this has different impacts than I initially thought. It goes back to the empathy. It goes back to putting yourself in other people's shoes. And so I think short answer is yes, but it's more than just go vote. It's, it's, it's an explanation of who's running, what the policies are, and what the impacts are beyond just on me, but on the least uh, among us. Thank you, Raj. I appreciate that answer. I feel like this conversation could keep going for a long time, but unfortunately we are running out of time. Um, I want to thank you all for participating. I'm actually gonna turn it back over to Kim and she has some final words for us tonight. Thank you all for attending this vital conversation, which is the first in a series of three conversations we are hosting this fall. Please join us on October 27th, and then again on December 1st for the rest of our fall series. Our October Vital Conversations dialogue partner will be from the Fifth Ward CRC and the Center for Urban Transformation, highlighting their work transforming communities through transforming lives. Their work in juvenile diversion out of the prison system is especially impressive. On December 1st, our dialogue partner will be scholars from Rice University's Houston Education Research Collaborative, sharing their research on the state of education in the Houston area and what can be done to improve the education of many. But more immediately, we hope that you can join us next week for our program sponsored by Empower, our women's initiative from IRCP. 
who is hosting Megan Phelps Roper, a former member of Westboro Baptist Church, a notorious hate group known for picketing military funerals and espousing hatred and bigotry. She will share her compelling story of her personal journey of spiritual transformation moving from hate to love. Please visit www.imgh.org to learn more about these events. To register and to support our work with a financial gift, a link is also in the chat box now. I want to thank Bridgeway Capital Management once again for being our sponsor for this evening. Bridgeway's passion and commitment for doing good here in our community and globally is deeply inspiring and appreciated. Thank you to our panelists and thank you to members of the IMGH family who have attended, especially our president and CEO, Martin 